tell us a little bit about that, about adapting to the changing populations. So there will be countries where there has been a white majority, but there will not be in the future. How do we go through that process? Is this bound to happen? And, and what are the ways in which we make it happen peacefully? Right, yeah. So in, in the book, I sort of go through the populist moment, the post-2014 rise of UKIP National Front in France, and then subsequently with Trump uh, and Salvini and others. And essentially, the argument is that it is this ethno-cultural shift that is ultimately behind the rise of national populism, not economic hard times or distrust of the system or something mm. like that. Um, yeah, and of course, you look at the United States, it's projected to have a, a non-Hispanic white uh, population dipping below 50% around 2050. Canada, New Zealand, not much further than that. And then in Western Europe, it'll be towards the end of the century. And I think this really will be a defining shift uh, that is going to shape the political landscape. How does it shape it? It shapes it in terms of two responses. You either uh, embrace that diversity and equity and you sort of champion it, and that's kind of where the, the cultural left is going. Uh, or you're saying, actually, we want to sort of safeguard, slow things down, uh, national community becomes important. So you get the other side reacting. And that's really the one of the major fault lines that we face. And so in explaining the rise of national populism, you cannot uh, downplay, you, know, you can't, can't talk enough about the importance of these sort of slow moving but consequential ethnic shifts. Yes, the ethnic, ethnic shift itself, do you think that can be um, adapted or changed or influenced? Or do you think that's pretty much a given? And really what we're talking about here are the reactions of the left and the right to it. Um, it's not a given in the sense that the pace of immigration, the scale of immigration, can shape the speed of that transformation. And also, clearly, the assimilation process and melting process uh, through intermarriage is also occurring. So what it is really about is about the speed of migration and the increase of diversity on the back of that versus the speed of assimilation and the decrease of diversity on the back of that and where the balance of those two things should be. Um, and I think the problem in a way that we face is that on the left side of the ledger, there's a tendency, tendency to say that if you're not in favor of rapid high-speed change, you're a bigot. So you're either an open person or a closed person. And that's shut down the debate over the speed, the proper speed of ethnocultural change and of assimilation in a society. It's very difficult to raise those issues. So the only people who can raise them are populists like Donald Trump um, or Matteo Salvini. And, and that is why, one of the reasons we've seen the rise of populism, because they are talking about things that the mainstream is too scared to talk about. You talked about the rise of populism in 2014. You gave some, some examples. Is, is that because you think the rise of populism is over or has it stabilized? What, what, what's your view on that? Uh, no, I think it's a feature of the system that we have now because of this ethnocultural shift and the taboos around talking about it uh, in, amongst elite centrist parties, there is an opportunity for national populists who are willing to have that conversation and press that issue. Uh, the, the, the main issues have sort of largely revolved and realigned from the economic left-right free market versus redistribution issues to the more cultural sort of globalist, nationalist, open, closed, whatever you want to call it, those issues, I think, are going to be, going to be defining Western politics. And, and that's why so-called populism, the reason we have populism is because the elite center mainstream is not willing necessarily to touch these hot button issues. So you have to move to these populist parties. And so I do think it's going to be a feature then of politics going forward. Back in the 1980s, I was campaigning in Birmingham, where there had already been very considerable population shifts. And I was very struck by a thing that a voter said to me, a white voter. And she said, um, you know, I see this transformation around me of the population. Um, and I don't necessarily have an objection to that. But I want to know at what moment was I asked by politicians whether that was what I wanted? At what point was this ever put to the population? And that question stuck in my mind, and it helped me to explain the um, 2016 referendum result, not in the direct way that people were kind of voting against immigration, but rather that uniquely they were being given the chance to decide something about their society. And because, most unusually, almost uniquely, they've been given this opportunity, they seized it. Yeah, but no, I think that's right. Um, and, and, you know, this is part of, again, the problem is because 
you know, if we look at the psychological literature, you know, they've done experiments where they say, oh, imagine the, the United States being majority non-white uh, and then answer these questions. And actually, what you get is a lot of people become a lot more conservative on immigration, they become more populist, all of these things. And so I think this is sort of well established. The other thing that's well established, though, is attachment to your own group and to your own way of life is not the same as dislike, superiority towards another group. Again, mm. a very well-established finding in the psychology literature. So if I'm really attached to my family, it doesn't make me dislike the family next door more. Um, and yet these two things have been squashed together. So anyone who expresses disquiet about pace of ethnic change is seen as a bigot. Actually, that's wrong. They may just be attached to their own group, their own uh, city or whatever. That's not the same thing as disliking a group. And yet those things are conflated, which makes it impossible to have the conversation. And so those pressures are built up and they're released at certain moments. And 2016 was one. I mean, if we look at the Brexit vote, immigration was the top issue for 40 percent of Brexit voters. That pretty much tells you what's behind that phenomenon. Do, do you want to say something about the uh, progress of um, integration? I mean, I was very impressed in a way by the United States. I mean, obviously, you mm. had a, a, a black American president. Sorry, you're Canadian. I'm actually. Canadian, but yeah, yeah, it's yeah, all right. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, um, uh, the, the United States had a, a, right. a black president. It had uh, two black uh, secretaries of state. Um, more recently, I've been quite impressed by the United Kingdom. Um, you know, we have had a, n a number of uh, people of Asian origin in the cabinet, and now, indeed, uh, prime minister. Are you impressed by the speed of integration, or do you think it's out of kilter with the change of the population mix? Well, it depends what level we're talking about. So I think in terms of employment, um, in terms of British identity, uh, it's been a success. And I think the U.S. is also a success. But, of course, that's at the level of political and economic integration. My own belief, in a way, is that without the intermarriage and identificational ethnic assimilation, the deeper kind of ethnic assimilation, which if you look in the U.S., American history at the Jews and Italians and Irish and all these people who arrived uh, over 100 years ago. You know, it took three or four generations for ethnic neighborhoods to break up, marriage to cross Catholic, Protestant, Jewish lines. Mm. I think for that deeper ethnic assimilation, we're talking sort of three, four generations. Um, and so that's why, even though you can have successful economic and political integration, without that deeper integration, you're going to get these pressures around to people seeing and not feeling familiar in a particular environment. So, yes, long term, their assimilation is going to happen, but in the medium term, we're going to get pressures around it. Um, change of subject. You've yeah. ri written quite interestingly, interestingly on the origins of wokery. Now, uh, yes. people might not think that the origins matter very much, but there, there is academic debate about this. And one of the reasons it's important to understand the origin is perhaps then one could understand the best way to counter it. If you were inclined to counter it. Do you want to say a word about that? Well, yeah, sure. I mean, the first thing to say is just a def quick definition for people. Wokery, wokeness, you know, making sacred of historically marginalized race, gender, and sexual identity groups. That's woke. Sacred, yeah, that's wrong. Making it sacred. And it's tied to an ideology which I call cultural socialism, which is that uh, you have to have equal outcomes for historically marginalized race, gender, and sexual identity groups, and harm protection, including psychological protection from offense or emotional safety. So that's wokeness. Um, where does it come from? I think there's kind of... Now, there's a couple of books out recently, Chris Rufo's America's Cultural Revolution. There's another book by a writer called Richard Hanania uh, on the origins of woke. And there's really two views on this, but I think there's really two pathways. Um, and the one is more about cancel culture, and the other is more about critical race, radical gender theory and ideology. If we take cancel culture, that actually comes more through a sort of incremental evolutionary process, starting with well-intended, uh, you know, this idea of preventing discrimination, but then that becomes, oh, uh, your work force isn't mirroring the population, you need quotas and timetables, uh, or it's, well, we have to be sensitive uh, to different groups, and that then becomes hypersensitivity. Uh, oh, you are criticizing the supreme leader of Iran, that's is Islamophobia, that's making the workplace a hostile environment. So hmm. this is the slow ratcheting effect. That explains kind of political correctness. It explains um, some of the things that occur within the woke corporation, so to speak, um, and cancel culture, people being fired for uh, faux pas. 
but then you have the sort of critical race theory stuff, which has more of a kind of revolutionary post-Marxist input. So the left, new left giving up on class, moving to identity as the new source of radical social change. Uh, in the 1960s, Herbert Marcuse and the new left, Black Panther, uh, movement, third world socialism, and all that kind of radicalism, which then feeds through into uh, critical race theory and radical feminism, and then eventually winds up in terms of, you know, DEI and, well, the content of some of the radical DEI and also the teaching in schools and defund the police movement. So you have these kind of two strands, if you like, one that's more about cancel culture, one that's more about uh, critical race and gender ideology, but they kind of now are overlapping in many ways.